Welcome to, uh, I think, the first session of the 2011 Ideas Festival. It's called From the Noughties to 2011, What Sort of Tweeny is Australia? I'm Paul Barclay from ABC Radio National. We're recording today's session for Big Ideas on Radio National, and uh, I'm glad you came along to uh, be part of the discussion. This is the 10th Ideas Festival. I've been to all of them, including the very first one in 2001. We were broadcasting a program live to air from that festival, and I remember it well because one of the festival's star international guests was to be live on our program that night, but he went missing in action. Actually, not so much missing as not turning up at all in the first place. Uh, some days later, I won't mention his name, I found out he'd got off the plane in Auckland. Uh, by the time he realised that he'd got off not only in the wrong city, but in the wrong country, it was too late. So he got back in the plane and flew back to the Northern Hemisphere where he came from, never to arrive at the Ideas Festival at all. So I'm relieved that I have four guests here today. Uh, got here early to make sure that they were all here. And from the vantage point of that first festival in 2001, it was not entirely easy to predict where we would be a decade later. Less than a month after that festival, 9-11 plunged the world into a crisis that we still haven't recovered from. Two wars, a complete shift in geopolitical thinking. Back then, the social networking site of choice was, I'm informed, Friendster, not Facebook. Would we have predicted millions of Australians would sit transfixed in front of their television sets watching a bunch of people competitively cooking and obsessing over food, food we could neither smell nor eat, but still fascinated by it? Only the pessimists, I think, would have predicted back in 2001 that the world would still be collectively gnashing its teeth over the prospect of climate change Actually, back then, uh, we called it, in less Orwellian terms, global warming. Uh, but, you know, would we, have, would we have thought back then that actually there would be no international effective action on climate change? We're here today to look at Australia uh, as a 21st century tweeny. That's a pre-teen, by the way. Uh, and we're going to do it through the lens of food futures, sustainability and happiness. We have a very diverse panel for you today. Each of them is going to give a short presentation to you, then we're going to have a conversation, then we're going to take some questions and comments from you. So when we do come to you, please have something to say because I'm sure you do have views on the many things we're discussing. Let me introduce our guests uh, one by one. Um, maybe they can wave as I announce them, but Mara Boone uh, is uh, with these days, she's the CEO of Green Cross Australia, the founding CEO. Uh, it was founded by Mikhail Gorbachev, actually, to foster a shift towards a secure and sustainable future. But Mara has been a financial analyst with Morgan Stanley. She's worked in Silicon Valley for the World Bank on an earthquake reconstruction program in Kathmandu for Greenpeace Australia, for Choice. Lots of good causes. Uh, Theodora Lusuke began working in government in the US. Uh, she's worked in public and private companies, NGOs and governments, working on business strategies and planning. She managed the Australian Writers Marketplace Digital Strategy, which was really about uh, getting an online presence for writers. She was chair of the Queensland Writers' Centre and now, and this is what we'll talk mostly about today, puts her passion behind black and white, an Indigenous writing and editing project based right here at the State Library of Queensland. Peter Marchant is a food and wine guy, as a result, the most popular man in the room, no doubt. Um, he's been director and co-owner of Brisbane's Restaurant 2 and later Bistro 3. He now works at Mezzanine Wine. Uh, another good reason to get to know him. He's the man to talk to, really, when you want a good bottle of wine. He's a certified sommelier, I hope I've got that right, uh, the Queensland Chair and a member of the National Executive of Sommeliers Australia, and uh, he actually wrote the wine list for the hit reality TV show Conviction Kitchen, filmed on location, I understand, in Bistro 3. Uh, and finally, Amanda Newbury uh, manages one of Queensland's biggest 
Communications Consultancies, BBS PR. She is a strategic communication specialist, trusted advisor to corporate and government executives. And prior to BBS, Amanda worked as a journo for the Courier Mail on just about everything, really. Education, parliament, courts, arts, the whole kit and caboodle. Will you please welcome them? And we're going to kick off with Mara saying a few words. It's over to you, Mara. Um, are we right? I think we are right, except I need to kind of connect. Here we go. We've got someone coming to help. How fantastic. So, look, I, I might just start while we are uh, setting up down here. Um, Green Cross, you may not have heard of. We're a new environment group in Australia. We're part of a global network, and we empower people to respond to environmental change. So we do that in a partnership model, and everything that we do is through digital outreach. We have two staff, uh, but working from an office here in Brisbane, we've reached over 100,000 people in many, many countries and deeply reached particularly in disaster-affected communities. Also working with kids and empowering them to prepare for a century which uh, will have um, a very different sort of uh, emphasis, I think. Um, ah, sensational. <gasps> no. no. That would be great. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> So in, in just a few uh, kind of minutes, I wanted to share with you the sense that uh, we are on the cusp of a rapidly changing society, which of course as humans we, we, we share a planet with so many other species. That society is now having a quite profound impact. And in a sense we're racing against ourselves because the faster we connect, the faster we can encourage different behaviors. Um, and yet we live with the legacy of past behavior. So that is, I think, uh, a critical kind of uh... Oh, unbelievable. <laughs> um, if someone could, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think any of your masters work. <laughs> I've tried everything. Ah. Oh! Hallelujah! Okay, so here, here is the framework that um, a really wonderful thinker from MIT uses. Uh, he talks about how all of the change over the entire 20th century can be compressed into 20 years in today's time, and that's because the speed of discovery has been advancing across all disciplines of science and at, you know, in society as we embrace those, those differ differences. Even year to year, we're discovering so much more that at this pace of discovering, all of the 20th century would be discovered in 14 years, and we fast forward that quicker and quicker and quicker. So if you imagine what the 21st century will be like at its end, given the escalating rate, rate of change, it's um, hard to imagine that it will be a thousand times greater than it was in the 20th century. So that's kind of the, the framing. And I'd like to think that a lot of that actually began, began with semiconductors as we started to understand electronics, which have, of course, ultimately boomed this notion of uh, connectivity and how we communicate um, across business and society. Gordon Moore, who was the co-founder of Intel back in 1965, foresaw this rule that was really quite simple, that you, know, you could fit the number of transistors on a chip at twice the amount, you could double that, um, every two years, you know, 18 months to two years, so that over time, if you kept the cost the same, you would have this escalating uh, power of computing power. And boy, have we seen that in spades. Uh, back in, you know, the early 70s, if you can imagine 
a mainframe computer costing $100,000, which is the equivalent of you know, close to $380 for 1,000 bytes of memory, and you can now buy 8 billion bytes online from, from Amazon for uh, $12. So that's the rate of change that we've been experiencing. And if you look at that graphically and just imagine um, a downward curve over the 50s, 60s, 70s, early, 80s, 90s, and then into the century, it's the affordability of that memory and technology that has empowered a future which we can't really conceive of. And one of the uh, shows that I like uh, actually isn't on the ABC, it's on Al Jazeera, and I watch this all the time. It's called The Stream, and picture uh, hosted in Abu Dhabi with a wall of Twitter feeds with two people on um, you know, live links through Skype in different parts of the world debating increasingly these days the situation in the Middle East and the, you know, democratic uh, challenges that are unveiling there, often with competing views, with analysts on the couch that are separately tweeting to people involved in those disputes. So if someone is saying it is happening or it isn't happening, they're then looking live on videos. And that conversation is broadcast globally through, uh, you know, television. So this is the kind of environment that Moore foresaw, probably not even imagining the consequences for uh, democracy. So I like to imagine then, is it possible that that same law, because after all technology is driven by electronics, could, could really see that fast forwarding on, you know, as an example, solar PV? And we have these debates in Australia. It's easy to poo-poo solar because we have policy settings that come and go. People think it's really good and it's a ripoff, you know, et cetera, et cetera. In the background, we are seeing a very similar cost curve, a learning curve on solar adoption globally. And uh, you may not realize if you read the mainstream media in Australia, but recently Bloomberg Finance um, looked at Apple's iPad as a metaphor for growth of solar in the US. Solar PV panels in the US, wholesale prices have dropped 75% in 10 years. And that's before new generation technology becomes unfolded. We are now seeing organic solar that has flexible panels, so you can put them on the back of trucks, you can put them over you know, uh, all kinds of flexible different um, uh, framing uh, technologies. So I put on solar PV in 2009. I live up in the hinterland in the Gold Coast. And in our little valley, we now have four neighbors that have put it on. And we were really interested, my husband and I, when we realized the three and a half kilowatts that we put on less than two years ago, cost our next door neighbor half the price. That's how quickly we are seeing this market change. So, is it possible that what is being predicted now very quickly in the US, and that is price parity, the price point at which new technologies can actually compete on a market basis with fossil fuel technologies, is approaching because Moore's law is being fast forwarded through different technologies and different take up. That is an intriguing question because, again, we so often hear that this is all pie in the sky and very expensive and impossible. We are actually quite close to wholesale price break-even. So then I started asking myself, goodness, what does this mean in terms of, you know, the big question of a warming planet? And I'm very mindful that roughly half of Australia believes climate change is not human-induced. And for those that believe that, it's very irritating to hear these debates. But the other half that accepts the peer-reviewed science is very concerned, and rightly so, because we see this tracking pattern between the concentration of CO2 gases in our atmosphere on the one hand and uh, gradual warming on the, uh, in the planet in the other. But here's the pickle that we're in. There is a 35-year thermal inertia period between when the gases concentrate and when we feel the experience of that concentration in our weather. So think about that. What it means is, what we're experiencing now, query, whether it's directly related to climate change, part of a pattern, you know, how you can assess that trend, that relates to concentrations of CO2 35 years ago. Back then, we had several billion people less on the planet. China and India hadn't unfolded. We didn't have industrialization in the South at the speed that we currently have. And then fast forward that 35 years. And imagine, we don't yet know what the consequences of our concentration are likely to be. So we are in a race to actually speed up change. And the interesting thing for me is the power of social media and personal connectivity in influencing each other's behaviors. And I'm particularly interested because early this year, the CSIRO released a very, very important bit of attitude research around climate change. They interviewed 5,000 people in a very, very deep research piece across Australia. 
And one of the interesting insights, in addition to the fact that the country is deeply polarized about you know, whether climate change is human-induced or not, they actually, people are getting, taking more and more trust and feedback from their friends and family than ever as sources of advice. So when you think about friends and attitudes and influence, you know, it's not too long of a stretch to think about Facebook. Now, Facebook we think of as this huge thing that has arrived, but actually it has only just begun. Facebook will need to reinvent itself 10 times in the next 10 years to stay in a leadership position. It has around 500 million users globally. There are five billion handheld devices that at some stage will be online. And we are now at the broadband level seeing countries in, de in the developing world that are actually prioritizing laying broadband cable in comparison to roads. That is the speed of potential change for broadband. So the question I leave with you is, could it be that we are actually moving forward faster in discovery than we ever thought? and that we can even enhance that through connecting to each other. Thanks. Terrific, Mara. Peter, Marchant, your turn. Thanks very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm sort of taking uh, a look at where our industry, and I say our, um, I call it food and booze, which is the non-glamorous term for restaurants, uh, has come in the last 10 years and what's happened and how that's influenced us uh, in Australia. Um, change is a, a, a huge thing and um, as Mara pointed out, the, the speed of change these days has been quite phenomenal. In the last 10 years, the change in product development, uh, product access, uh, getting things to Australia that we didn't used to get, um, products that were, weren't grown here are now grown here. Uh, so from restaurants they have access to so many new products that they didn't have before. The sharing of information, uh, about literally uh, before 2000, uh, the biggest form of chefs talking uh, generally was their cookbooks. They'd produce a cookbook, chefs here would then buy the cookbook uh, that was probably two years, prepared two years earlier with uh, recipes and they'd read that cookbook and then get inspiration. So in Australia, we tended to be around 18 months to two years behind a lot of food trends. Um, and some would argue that in Brisbane, we were 10 years behind everyone else. Um, that, those days are now gone. Uh, websites uh, for restaurants are updated uh, generally quite often. Uh, other chefs can get online and have a look what everyone's doing, get ideas, and that sharing of information has been, uh, has been crucial in developing restaurant menus, uh, which is what we eat. Uh, there's a, the term uh, locavore, which sort of started in the US, which is about eating locally. Uh, that's something that's certainly developed in the last 10 years. There's a couple of restaurants in Brisbane that do that very well. Sprout at Milton that has his little veggie garden at the back and goes out and gets as much as he can from that garden, um, which has got that idea of climate change in the background and the, the concept of food miles and how, how much money and how much effort and how much carbon it takes to get food to your table. Uh, and as I said, that's a huge part uh, of, of quite a... a a lot of new restaurants. 2004, there was a little uh, show made uh, called Super Size Me, uh, which we all saw. Uh, a friend of mine actually watched it eating McDonald's. Uh, he hasn't had it since. Um, not, not, not a great experience. Uh, we thought that would probably do more than what it did. Um, a certain entity that was featured in that came out pretty well from that, uh, from that movie. Uh, but it has made some change with that business. But internationally, fast food is still quite huge. Blogging uh, started around 2002. People just talking about what they ate, where they ate it, and what they thought about it. Wine production in Australia increased dramatically. Uh, in the early 2000s, we had a lot of successful vintages, uh, and then we've had some very tough vintages of late. Uh, this year, uh, in most of South Australia, we had rain. Uh, most of South Eastern Australia, I should say, so uh, South, South Australia and Victoria, lots of rain. Prior to that, there was two years of heat. Prior to that, there was three years of drought. So it's been pretty tough. Um, and that's impacted uh, on orders being fulfilled. That said, in 2008, 2009, there was thousands and thousands of cases of wine sitting on docks, ready to go to the UK and the US. Orders were cancelled because of the GFC. People weren't spending money on Australian wine. Therefore, with, with that change, I suppose, those markets falling out, people started looking towards other markets. Uh, China, there's 1.3 billion people in China. Um, a lot of research has been done recently. Uh, the Chinese don't drink a lot of wine, uh, generally speaking, but there's a lot of similarities between wine and tea. 
Uh, so all of a sudden there's this reference between the tannin, which is an acid that's found in wine, uh, and, the, and, and also in tea. And everyone sees it as the new frontier, and a lot of people are investing a lot of money in selling their wine into China. GST started in 2000, uh, which affected small business dramatically, particularly restaurants. Uh, and a lot of restaurants closed uh, 2001, 2002 around Australia, just not being able to cope with the extra amount of paperwork. Wages have been on the rise consistently since 2000, and the average spend per meal has been down, uh, and slowly going down since 2000 as well. A few new principles that have been discussed quite heavily these days in wine production is the terms organic, uh, biodynamic, and sustainable, uh, and they're certainly three words that are going to be used a lot in the next 10 years as well. Australian dollar in September 2000, 2000 was 54 US cents. This morning it was $1.06. That has had a dramatic impact on uh, the food and wine industry in Australia because tourism, internal tourism, is a massive part of that industry. Uh, at the moment, uh, I've got friends who live in Melbourne and Sydney who now go to New Zealand for the weekend as opposed to going to Noosa. Uh, and that spend, the dollars going offshore rather than staying internally. The media has had a huge impact uh, over on our industry in the last 10 years. Um, in 2000, there was a bloke uh, who swears a lot called Gordon Ramsay. He only had two Michelin stars back then. In 2001, he got a third Michelin star. In 2001, he had a lunch at his restaurant for six people uh, in London that cost £44,000, uh, $110,000. Uh, at that point in time, I guarantee that hasn't happened since. In 2000, there was a young bloke called Jamie Oliver who got noticed in the background of another TV show being shot by the BBC in the UK. I'm sure you've all heard of him. He does okay. Since then, we've had some interesting shows in Australia. Luke Nguyen's uh, show that he shot in Vietnam, absolutely wonderful, showing the regional flavours of Vietnam. Maeve O'Meara's show, um, the, the Food Safari on the SBS, incredible show, showing how people eat uh, in, in different cultures. And there was another little show in 2009, which you may or may not have heard of, called MasterChef. Uh, that is a phenomenon. Uh, MasterChef has taken our industry to a different level. It's opened a lot of things up to what we call, you know, the regular people, so to speak. What it has done is got people talking about food. It's got people sharing food, making food, and dining out. So, as a whole, the industry is quite happy with what MasterChef has done. The blogging that's happened since MasterChef, in particular, has just ramped up again. Uh, and as I said, people telling everyone, literally everyone, where they ate, what they ate, and what they thought of it. There's this armchair critic that has come in that is affecting the business uh, quite dramatically. It is constant. In the past, the reviewing of restaurants used to happen on two days a week, Tuesdays and Saturdays, that was it. Uh, and monthly in the Gourmet Traveller, they were the magazines that people sort of paid attention to. Now, in 140 characters, someone can be sitting at dinner tweeting about what's happening. Uh, and I can tell you that that happens a lot. Uh, and hashtags are created at dinners and all of a sudden things take a life of their own, but they're instantaneous reviews. Restaurants are now having to deal with those reviews, whether they be positive or negative, and it's, a, it's certainly a, a grey area for a lot of restaurants. Uh, social media strategy is not something that they generally spend a lot of time on. They want to sell food and booze, and that's it. The reality of MasterChef, uh, I'll use reality in inverted commas, um, can be quite uh, skewed. Uh, I always look at the um, experience they have. Generally, they take them into a restaurant and they have one service in a restaurant for four hours. And they're all sweating and go, this is the hardest day of my life. Get up and do it again tomorrow. And then the next day, and then the next day, and the next day. So that reality that is edited out is obviously quite different from real life. Social media, obviously in 2004, Facebook uh, started and that co connectivity uh, between the world, as Mara was saying, is quite ridiculous. The amount of users in Australia is well above 40%. The US, it's about 45 now, almost 50%. And we're talking about uh, 500 million users uh, worldwide currently. Twitter uh, is a new, uh, well, newish, five years, 2006, Twitter started. Uh, and that's had a, a huge impact in our industry. Um, but it's positive, uh, for the most part. Um, that connection. Uh, I think a lot of people are still talking about Twitter and they don't really know what it, what it does. And for me and for our industry, what it does is it allows people to connect to producers, to restaurants, to winemakers, and actually have that conversation. Um, and that conversation is what is very important in developing their businesses. Um, it is very much a two-way street. Uh, it's not a broadcast uh, message, which a lot of people are not doing well at the moment. Um, but that connection gives people... Uh, gives them a relationship, and whether that relationship be real or perceived, doesn't matter, because it means they think they, they know what's going on, and that's very important. What's next? Um, we had four million people watching MasterChef finale last year. What's well, one in four, you know, one in five people in Australia watching one program at, uh, at once. That's quite scary, 
um, but also very exciting. So the next 10 years, who knows where we're going to be. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. I'm getting hungry and thirsty. I'm glad it's before midday, actually, or we'd have to pull a cork out. Um, Amanda. Tad shorter than Peter. Um, I want to bore you with a story of what I did when I woke up this morning. So I woke up late, it was 6.30, and the first thing I did was I rolled over, like I do every morning, I didn't kiss my husband, I rolled over and grabbed my mobile phone. I checked my SMSs, and somehow someone had SMSed me in the middle of the night. I checked my emails, I checked my Twitter feed, what else did I check? Oh, I scanned the news for my headlines and I checked my Facebook. And then I rolled over and I kissed my husband. And that's what I do every morning. And it's a pretty sad and sorry story. And it's not just a sad and sorry story about me. I'm sure others do it as well. And that is that life in 2011 is complicated. And it's not that anything else has changed. I mean, the world is still the same, albeit climate change is a lot worse. Um, but what we do in our day-to-day -day lives isn't different. The, thing that's changed is how we communicate and how frequently we communicate and the fact that we are obsessed with communicating. So just as Peter has talked about the, the need for us to tweet while we're eating dinner at a lovely restaurant, uh, the fact that we can't step away from our desks without checking our emails a minute bef after we've left our desk says something about us. And so in 2001, I think life was a lot simpler because communication was simpler. If we wanted to talk to someone, you know what, we talk to them and we might pick up the phone and occasionally, just occasionally, we might email someone when it was really important. And that was pretty much the extent of what we did. We read the paper for news. We turned on the radio on the way to work in our cars we watch television at the end of the day at six o'clock. I don't know how many people are at home at six o'clock, but we're all trapped in the, in the traffic. And petrol, I thought, was around 77 cents, which would be amazing to have that today. And then a whole lot of thing cha things changed. And actually, it started changing in 2001, and that's Wikipedia. So for those of you who've never jumped onto Wikipedia, you've probably been living under a rock, but it is the online encyclopedia. It's where you go uh, when you want to know information. And it's not developed by experts, it's developed by people like you and me. And so Australia in 2011, as we enter our days as a tweenie, we are exactly as you would think a tweenie is. So a tweenie is that weird breed of child. They're pre-teens, uh, pre I should say. They're still nice, they're still polite, they're still sort of nicely, decently dressed but they're on the brink and the edge of change. They start to say strange things that you don't understand and the language is peppered with words like PEEP. I had a whole lot this morning and acronyms that I can't even repeat because they're too obscene. Uh, but Australia, I think, is actually a tweenie and there's three things that we are that's just like a tweenie. Um, aside from being obsessed with brands, and that is firstly we're mobile, everything's mobile, so everything's fast. You can't do anything at a normal speed now. So yesterday, as I sat in the Qantas Club to come home, I fought with a man for the last PowerPoint underneath the bench seat, and between the two of us we had to charge desperately or we would have a, a serious problem. We had two computers, two mobile phones, and two iPods, and we had one PowerPoint. Um, and that's because everything we do has to be done now, has to be done mobile. So obviously we live and breathe on our mobile phones. I think, and, and Paul might be horrified at this, but I think a lot of people are reading their news from their Twitter feeds. So they're getting the 140 characters and a lot of those characters are actually the hyperlink as well, which is a bit scary. I do think the one thing to watch though is that even though at the moment we feel distant from people, we're actually going to return to face-to-face -to -face communication, but it's actually going to be over our mobiles and over our phones and over our iPods. So we're going to bizarrely return to a face-to-face -face communication from where we are now. 
The second major thing that's happened, I think, in Australia is the media landscape, and we've touched briefly on that. But uh, when I was a journalist a very long time ago, uh, journalists were pretty rare, and they were sorry, but they were still pretty powerful. And it's who you went to when you wanted the news. And now everyone's a journalist. Everyone's a journalist, everyone's publishing something, everyone has an opinion, everyone has a level of expertise, and there's this thing called a blogger. So there's the media landscape and there's this blogger sphere. And in the blogger sphere are not just people who do this at home from a dark room when they're bored and tired at night with a glass of wine in their hand, um, they're actually professional. So recent research has shown that a third of bloggers are paid professionals. And they don't abide by a code of ethics, as journalists do, and they aren't educated, and they don't have the responsibility to get two sides of a story. So it is a massive shift in the way in which we get our information. It's a, a stark contrast into how we were informed in 2001. The other frightening thing about the media landscape is that I don't have to read everything when I open my paper. I don't have to get exposed to all of that now. I can just cherry pick what I want to know. So if I'm just interested in green, I just read green. If I'm just interested in economics, I just read economics. So you get a blinkered view, as tweenies do, you know. We're after one band and one band only. Um, and the third thing that's happening, and I think will be the biggest change for us, is the growth of community engagement. So just as tweenies find their voice, and they want to be heard, and they want to be loud, and they want to decide where they want to go and how they want to do it, that's Australia. And so from every little corner of the community, you are starting to hear voices that we didn't hear 10 years ago because people no longer protested. They no longer stood up and spoke out. And now we've got this tidal wave of community engagement. And I think that that will be the biggest uh, change. And hopefully Mara will be happy about that over the next 10 years. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Theodora, you need a video. And I think we might need a little bit of a hand to get the video started from somebody more technically adept than myself. You know, Aboriginal culture is the oldest continuous living culture in the whole world. I think that if we don't get our asses into gear now, then it's lost to all of us, not just blackfellas. And I think every time they bury an elder, they bury a library. So if you kind of think about it, that's really deep. You know, that, that's, that's a library that's gone that we're never going to read again. We're at the Cairns Indigenous Art Fair and we're here to promote black and white indigenous writing and editing at the State Library of Queensland. The exciting thing about this project is that it's about indigenous people, indigenous editors working on indigenous authored manuscripts. I grew, grew up reading about Baba Black Sheep and all of that, which didn't really relate to me and three little pigs, you know, it should have been three little kangaroos or something like that. For us to actually start to cultivate our, our own um, editors and uh, uh, is really important. Um, everybody give that a clap, I really like that idea. Is that... The comment you made in regards to losing our libraries is when our elders pass on. I just had this funny vision of, um, of a picture through the window of all these books and the librarian inside peeping out and all these black fellas sitting, all these old fellas sitting outside just enjoying the day the library outside and the library inside. And I think of all the mob at home. This has been a most marvellous event. So many people 
clearly involved in, in writing and preserving heritage. This is, this is great, a great event. It was just fantastic. It, it's just blew me away. It's fantastic. I think it's really, really good um, for Australia. Great initiative and it's good to see that the, we're expanding the arts beyond the visual arts side of things for Indigenous people. One, wonderful initiative. Queensland, Australia, the world. Where would it take them? Well, hey, there's a lot of places it could take them when you've got people like Eddie Dingo and people like Burry Pryor that's out there and doing it. There's a lot of scope. Yeah. I do the strategy for this project, and Sue, of course, is to deliver these great stories yeah. and bring these trainee editors to that point where they actually go, oh, yes, we are editors now, and it's real. Yes, we change positions between the head and the heart. <laughs> <laughs>
sort of assuming that because we started a little bit late that maybe we can crib a bit of time after 11 o'clock, uh, but it will be a slightly more constrained discussion afterwards because I do want to hear any questions or comments that you have from the audience. Peter, I might come to you uh, first of all. As you said, and as I said as well, none of us predicted in 2001 that uh, uh, the future of food would in fact be MasterChef, which is actually more than, if I can remind you, a television program. It is a brand in its own right. You can buy, as I recently discovered, MasterChef pizza stones and more. You've had some involvement in these reality cooking programs. Why are we all of a sudden so fascinated with celebrity chefs, the finer points of plating and food preparation, <laughs> uh, food as a competitive sport even? How, how did it come to this? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I think well, a couple of things. I think um, restaurants always had that kitchen wall and people couldn't see behind that wall. And there was always something going on there, some kind of alchemy that would come out, produce this plate of food. And, no one got to see how that actually happened. And I think that, that breaking down, you know, we talk about the fourth wall in, in, in theatre, um, you break that down and people can now come in and have a look. And I think that, that voyeuristic element, I suppose, is, is one of the reasons. Um, you know, in 2000, there was no such thing as a celebrity chef. No one knew what was going on. Um, MasterChef comes from, and not a lot of people know this, but it actually started in 1990 in the UK and was on air for 11 years uh, there. Uh, and did very well, but it didn't come here until you know 2009. But now, as you said, it is a brand. Now there's the spin-offs of you know kids and celebrities, and next year there is talk of a, uh, a professional edition, so actual chefs competing against each other, which I'm really looking forward to. <laughs> How many egos can you get in one room? <laughs> I love them all. <laughs> they, 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 could, they could come to blows. Look, that's one, uh, I suppose, way of looking at food futures. Uh, the other is, and uh, this has been a theme throughout, I think, all of the uh, conversation we've had so far, the rise of blogs and digital media, uh, especially Twitter in the case of the restaurant industry. It's now very, very easy for any of us to send out through our Twitter feed an opinion on a restaurant, perhaps a rather harsh opinion, perhaps also a positive opinion. These tweets can and do have a devastating effect on the future of some restaurants, don't they? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, there's um, been quite a few case studies of uh, bloggers who have uh, reviewed restaurants uh, and then the reaction by the restaurant on that blog, because obviously you can comment on the blog. And there was one uh, in Melbourne last year, the, towards the end of last year, where the response was uh, from the restaurant was... Uh, obviously written probably quite late at night after a couple of glasses <laughs> of wine, and it just didn't end well uh, for the restaurant in particular. And uh, we, we were talking earlier this morning about, you know, this, this community just got behind the blogger uh, instantaneously and went, hang on a second, this is their opinion. Who are you to say that you're awesome? Uh, this is the experience that they had. Uh, and, you know, the, the classic media, again, the reviewer would generally go to a, a restaurant at least twice. Uh, whereas bloggers and, 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 you know, when you're in a restaurant with Twitter, you're there maybe once and you might have the worst night of your life and that's all you, all you have as a reference point. So mm. it's the, the challenge for, for a lot of restaurants is dealing with this side of the media and dealing with, you know, every single person in their restaurant is a reviewer all of a sudden. It used to be you get them from time to time and you knew exactly who you were. Mm. If Matt Preston walks into your restaurant, you know he's walking into your restaurant. Mm. He's six foot four and weighs <laughs> 140 kilos. <laughs> he's the worst food reviewer ever in terms of being inconspicuous. But now it's every single person that's in there can be a reviewer. Yeah, look, it's changing every industry. Mara, I was struck by one thing that you said and that is that uh, slightly under half, uh, slightly under 50% of people don't believe in human-induced climate change given that we've been having this debate for the best part of 20 years, that in itself is an extraordinary figure. But I wonder about the power of social media, of people communicating with themselves and with their broader networks, the power of social media to begin to change that opinion. Yeah, that, that, that is a clinching critical question, I think, at, at this stage of uh, you know, the planet's uh, evolution. Um, on the one hand, I, I find it really exciting that people are reaching to their peers and family to influence attitudes towards things as important as climate change. On the other hand, um, you know, we have to remember that science is about trying to discover the truth of the natural world. And it has a method which is reviewed with great rigor. 
And around the world, we've developed a system to review that collectively. And so from there, there is this terrific wealth of wisdom that I find um, is just unbelievably important in terms of how we influence attitudes. So the combination between the two for me is really, really imperative. How is it that we start thinking about um, how we connect to each other around this notion of what is science as we are rapidly escalating the speed of discovery across all these disciplines with major, major consequences. The opportunity for social media is also its risk. So the opportunity is we can be tribes, we can be hordes, we can link from neighbors to friends to family around the world and old colleagues and the like. Um, on the other hand, we also can become quite uh, trivial, facile, and tribal in our spreading of really, really stupid ideas. Mm. <laughs> so between the two, I think, is a magic around um, something that I, I think is becoming increasingly transparent, and that is authenticity. Mm. You know, what is authentic in this world of brands, rapid change, and twinny like behavior? Well, you know, I think we have to kind of understand over time we will have these personal platforms like little TV stations, whether they're in phones or up our nose at some stage in small devices that we you know, press. Mm. Over time, we will be able to broadcast and connect and interact with each other more and more. And seeking that authenticity around things that really, really matter, like understanding the truth of our natural world and how our behavior impacts on it. Mm. Uh, like also, uh, when we're talking about authenticity, the stories of Indigenous people, yeah. stories that have been passed down through generation to generation, thousands of years, uh, but stories that traditionally have not made it into print for mainstream audiences to access. What role does social media and digital media have to play in your project, Theodora, in bringing these stories to people? Well, what we found is that um Capturing the stories is not necessarily the the biggest problem. It's um, ensuring that the um, it's in, ensuring that these stories stay within the communities and are credited to the communities because you have so many extraordinary experiences that have come through. So we see social media as a great tool because what we can do is have this global conversation. We find that um, Australia is a point in time. It's just one place. But the joy of reading a story can be your audience in France or in New York or wherever in the world. And because there are so many people outside of Australia who are hungry for indigenous stories, the markets are there. We utilize the digital to actually connect people to these stories. And because we have trainee editors, they're the gatekeepers. They're the ones, the indigenous editors, who will wor work those communities and make sure that they are going through a process of growing the communities as the stories spread. Mm. Mm. Amanda, I loved your story about waking up in the morning and uh, flicking on the smartphone. Uh, I spoke to Susan Mousart about this at the uh, last Brisbane Writers' Festival. She wrote a book about it. In fact, she realised when, when, she, when she started to take her phone to bed with her that there was time for radical change uh, uh, required. Uh, Are you not we'll... meant to do that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling a little nervous. I don't have my phone with me now. Uh, that, that's right. Uh, we, 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 we're, we're partly looking back over this past 10 years, and, and one of the lenses that uh, I was instructed to look through was this lens of happiness, yes. actually. Are we happier today than we were 10 years ago? Life is so tremendously fast mm. at the moment. Uh, the demands grow. The pressure to communicate, to connect all of the time, grows, it's sped up to frantic levels. We've spoken a bit about the opportunities. Do you think we're happier, though, living in this type of world? I'm happier when my phone's in my hand, <laughs> but, but, um, but I think there actually is, a, sh is, there is a, a recognition of this, and there's a growth of an industry which is around decluttering your life, and a lot of that actually starts with decluttering your media intake so that you, you aren't doing what I do every day. Uh, that's my job. But, but that actually people are saying, well, how can I pare everything back? And so they're starting to turn off uh, some of those avenues of communication. And there's lots of new software out there where actually instead of uh, posting, so if you're a blogger posting on Twitter and Facebook and your blog and all individually, you're doing it on one piece of software. So we're actually 
the thing that is destroying our happiness is actually there as perhaps our saviour to solve it by streamlining it so you have one feed mm. and, and one press of the button. In fact, that's the challenge, isn't it, of the digital age? So much information, so much access to everything uh, immediately, the filter, getting what you need, what you want. Well, actually, I think there's two problems. One is, one is the filter, so are there filters there um, and, and can they filter out what you want? But the danger in that is what you're getting is people who only have a tiny bit of information mm about a whole lot of topics. Mm. So you're having a narrowing of our understanding of the world rather than depth. Mm. And I, I think there's a, there's a real danger in people not understanding full stories. I heard this extraordinary uh, statistic the other day. I can't exactly remember it, but some unbelievably high proportion of people no longer use the internet per se. They use almost exclusively Facebook. Mm. It is their entire entry point mm. into the digital world. So they're getting their friendship uh, networking happening there, they're getting their news, they're getting their invitations to parties, uh, everything happening on that one website. Uh, it, it, and it, it puts it in an extraordinary, extraordinarily powerful position. And I'm wondering, Mara, a group like Green Cross trying to bring about change and sustainability, essentially a virtual organisation you are, you operate really in, in cyberspace. Can you harness uh, social networks like that to bring about the type of change that you're after? Look, I really hope so. Um, it, it's kind of an experiment in the making, as is this whole society <laughs> as it evolves. But um, we have chosen a partnership model where uh, the on the ground work that we do is, is through uh, community groups, businesses, government agencies, kind of you name it. Um, and yet what we do is catalyze and convene those partnerships online. So as an example of an experiment exactly in this, we uh, a few years ago asked the question, what is the risk around emergency response? And one of the answers was our emergency volunteering base is rapidly aging. We have 500,000 volunteers and the average age is now over 50. So how do we reach Gen Y and inspire them to join the SES and the Red Cross and you know St. John and the others? So we developed with young emergency volunteers a social media platform where we have about a dozen or so young emergency volunteers tweeting using Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, reaching out to their peers to inspire a new generation about what they do in connection to their concern about climate change. Mm. Now, it's an interesting strategy and approach. Um, we built that network. It's now been going for about a year and a half. Uh, there are 22,000 people that use it. And e each one of what we call our extreme weather heroes <laughs> have their own Facebook page, and they reach out to another five, mm. seven, eight hundred Facebook friends that then connect with others. So we hope that in this way we can catalyze this rejuvenation and kind of interest on the ground with these vital agencies that are going to be so important in coming decades. But, you know, part of me is like, is this vaporware? <laughs> yeah. And you sometimes run into people who say, oh yeah, but that's all nonsense because you might be going for hearts and minds, but how many people have registered at the door, how, you know? Mm. So it, it's funny, this thing. The other comment I wanted to quickly make mm is um, I hope my stepson Sam is listening to this. <laughs> All of these great young kids that are doing everything on twice, Facebook probably don't, don't know that 10 years from now, recruiters and universities are gonna look at their Facebook pages and see all this horrific language <laughs> and images and everything else. So we need to understand the responsibility around you know, taking control of how we communicate in such an open way. It's gonna be an interesting conversation to have in 10 years time mm -hmm. about uh, social media and social networking. We don't have a heap of time left. I do want to take some questions from uh, comments from the floor, if there, if there are any. Uh, um, I don't know whether people have been aroused or stimulated by some of the comments that have been made. I think we've got a gentleman in the front there. Can we get a mic to him? I'd like to involve the audience, you know, to some extent if I can. Um, I was very interested in the way that uh, social influence seems to be such a large part of our lives today and how it's actually trending to have more people dependent on their peers' opinions on different things. Mm. Um, I was reminded uh, that what June, uh, John Stuart Mill thought of uh, the desire to influence others being motivated by both the worst and the best in human nature. Mm. And it, it occurred to me, what can we actually do to encourage people to make their own discoveries rather than necessarily constantly turning to either their friends or to experts. Uh, typically in a lot of sustainability uh, panels, someone in the audience wants to know what can we as ordinary people do, but shouldn't we be finding ways to get people to find their own answers? Okay, who wants to have a crack at that? 
or we'll leave it. We'll leave, we could leave it as a comment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's. I, I, I'll have a crack. Yeah. Um, I think it's a bit of both. I, I think people will always have that um, that that sort of search for knowledge and that quest for truth. I think if we start losing that, then we're all in a whole world of hurt, I suppose, and that's what society is probably built on. Um, I think uh, that that the interaction uh, and the, the comments from the peers and that kind of thing is all part of that equation um, to then come up with your own opinion. Uh, I, I don't believe that someone you know is just born and then knows everything. My seven-year-old does, uh, <laughs> apparently. But um, I think you know getting those outside influences and and and, and researching. Uh, the challenge is what research you're looking at. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, you need all that information to be able to come up with your own opinion. Uh, you know, if I have a reservation about the interactive social media, it is that people seek out opinion rather than information. Mm. Whereas it should be the other way around. Find out what's happening and then reach your conclusion about what your belief is. On your own. Rather than uh, just getting the ready-made opinion given to you. It, it concerns me that people have opinions based on what they've read, not based on any factual basis, yeah. often. But I think part of that is those people who have the facts aren't on the social media platforms. So where you would ordinarily go to find those facts, they're not publishing it in a way that you want it. They've got static websites, which is fine, mm. and you've got to have that. But if I go onto Facebook where I want information on Twitter and I'm not getting that information, I'm going to get it from somewhere because I'm in a hurry. Mm. So th that's, I guess, the danger. Mm. Yes, Mara? Can, just chomping at the bit because I think it's a really, really important question. And again, just a, a practical example of how it can work when you get good information and leave it open to people on what they actually do with it. So we do a program for uh, 8 to 13-year-old kids, and we do this online. It's called The Green Lane Diary. We had 14,000 kids doing it, and we find out about what they're doing with feedback after they go through a 10-week module of environmental education, which is very fact-based and very sort of science-aligned and the like. We had a little boy uh, from Runcorn State School that won the kind of best diarist thing last year, and here's what he did. He found out about orangutans and about palm oil and about what was happening in Borneo. And so he decided to approach his tuck shop lady and ask her, what is in the noodles and the bickies and everything? Can we go through and do a bit of an audit? And then came back with his class the following week because they worked out that the noodles did have palm oil. And they sat down with the parents and the tuck shop and they have created not just really Queensland's first green tuck shop, but they've produced a video on how you green your tuck shop that we're going to do online this term when we go back into that program. So 20,000 kids can get into it. This is a little boy who just read about it, loved orangutans, and decided, here's what I can do. That's a great example. And at the complete other end of the spectrum, bigger picture example, when WikiLeaks leaked all of those diplomatic cables that let people know what governments were really thinking about other people's governments, this was at about the time that the Tunisian people were rebelling against their leadership, their oppressive leadership. The concern that the Tunisians had was that if they took action against their leadership, the Americans would come and stomp on them. They found out through the leaked diplomatic cables that none of us were ever meant to see that actually the Americans supported them. This emboldened them as a people's movement and a revolution uh, took place, all because information is much more widely and easily available on the web. So from greening the tuck shop through to these revolutions in Northern Africa and the Middle East, we're seeing just the profoundest influence of uh, social media, I think. Uh, maybe one more question, I think we might have to wrap it up. Or a comment, yep. What's really interesting, what's really interesting to me is I, I brought with me a document that I've been reading to try and get done during the day, which is, comes out of the Knight Commission in the States, which is about sustaining democracy in the digital age. And I thought there's just a really interesting comment here that might be to, good to finish on. Just talking about the creation of informed communities, which are places where the information ecology meets the personal and civic information needs of the people. And that means that people have the information they need to take advantage of life's opportunities for themselves and their families. It also means that they can participate fully in our system of self-government to stand up and be heard. And paramount in this vision are the critical democratic values of openness, inclusion, participation, empowerment, and the common pursuit of truth and the public interest. Mm. It's really about giving people access to the information they need um, through good journalism, through social media, through um, equality of access, and a lot of it is about the 
divide, the digital divide between the people who don't have mobiles and the people who do have mobiles and the people who don't have um, local journalism and the people who don't have libraries and the people who don't have the capacity to actually be informed and saying we need a vision for a society where all communities are informed communities that allow us then to progress. So I thought it was a, an interesting synergy with the, con, uh, the discussions that's been had this morning. Mm. Yeah. Can Can, yes, great theory. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say that um, from someone who came out of um, government in the United States and has worked in global business and is now doing a project like this, um, I, I would say that um, where we are today, knowledge is information, wisdom is power. Um, people can get knowledge, people can share that knowledge with their democratic constituents, people can talk to their representatives. However, the way that you actually change things is to show how it works within society. And one of the reasons why we've actually created an, an exegetical framework, meaning that um, the training editors are getting master's degrees, is because what we understand is the way universities work today are to give people jobs. And what universities were supposed to be for is to be able to think and how to debate and how to utilize your mind in a way where if your job becomes redundant, why would you care? Because you understand how to move on to the next thing. And it's because we're not able to build the intelligence at the same level that we build our communication, we're starting to see huge gaps. And one of our thesis is that if we go back to those um, cultures, because in my view, we have one race and it's a human race, but we have many different cultures. And if we go to different cultures and look at the people who haven't actually gone into the digital yet and what they're doing well and use that almost start over again and lead with that, perhaps, perhaps we can get somewhere that we don't know about yet. Don't get me started on our universities, Theodora. <laughs> <laughs> I come from a long line uh, of academics. They'd uh, all be rolling over. Yeah, <laughs> uh, such, such a good point. Can I just uh, ask you to wrap up? Uh, because the project is so interesting. And, and Theodora told me on the phone yesterday when I was talking to her, that between 1990 and 2010, there were only 39 books published novels. by novels, published by Indigenous authors mm -hmm. in this country. Clearly, your project seeks to address that. Um, where do you hope you'll be with this project and with Indigenous literature in 10 years' time? Well, that's a very good question because we're thinking more 20 years' time. Sue and I will be unemployed. <laughs> the trainee editors will have become editors and they will have basically buttressed this community of writers. And with that, Australian writing will get more of a look in because the Indigenous writing won't be in a silo. And we'll look at writing from that perspective of it is a community, but led by Indigenous writing with its energy. Mm. Mm. We better wrap it. It's been a terrific uh, conversation and terrific series of presentations. Thanks to Peter, Amanda, Mara and Theodora. And thanks to you for coming along. <laughs>